Hi, this is Richard Sudlock. Welcome back to the Green Ninja course on climate science. In this episode, we'll briefly investigate some ways in which plate tectonics affects Earth's climate system. In particular, we'll look at mountain building and volcanic eruptions, two of the many processes caused by plate tectonics, and two that have very different effects on climate. A quick reminder of what you may remember from sixth grade or wherever else you encountered plate tectonics. The upper 20 to 100 kilometers of the Earth is broken into thin, curved slabs of rock called plates that move slowly with respect to one another. This map shows the boundaries of those plates as red lines. At divergent plate boundaries, which you can see in the cartoon on the lower right, plates move away from one another to pr produce spreading ridges in the oceans. At transform boundaries, like the one in the left-hand block diagram, plates slide past one another, as they do in California. Where plates move towards one another, we find convergent boundaries. And this is where most of the world's volcanic eruptions, major earthquakes, and chief climate influences happen. Here are important ways in which plate tectonics affects climate. Lateral or sideways movements of plates determine the position of land masses and ocean basins. This directly controls ocean and air circulation. Vertical movement of Earth's surface, especially at convergent boundaries, also affects the circulation patterns of air and ocean. Volcanic eruptions, mostly at convergent boundaries, have immediate, strong, but temporary impacts on regional or global climate. Let's look at some examples. The positions of the continents and ocean basins on Earth's surface dictate the circulation patterns of the oceans that we looked at in the last episode, and to a lesser extent, of the atmosphere also. The roughly oval circulation patterns of the ocean waters exist because of the north to south, la north to south layout of the continents. Imagine how different things might look if all the continental mass of North America was south of the equator next to North America, for example. Even very small changes in the positions of the continents could produce very significant climate changes. This is a reconstruction of the geography of the Western Hemisphere about 20 million years ago. The Americas are a bit closer to Europe and Africa, but there's another key geographic feature that differs from modern geography. Do you see it? There's no Isthmus of Panama. How might climate have been affected? by the absence of that isthmus 20 million years ago. Well, prior to construction of the isthmus, Pacific waters flowed east through the Central American seaway and mixed with waters of the Atlantic, thereby balancing the salinity of the world's oceans. But by about 5 million years ago, that's abbreviated capital M, small a, million years, the seaway was so narrow that mixing had ceased. Circulation patterns of winds and oceans caused the Atlantic to become slightly saltier than the Pacific. For a while, this resulted in a warmer North Atlantic region due to the Gulf Stream and related currents. But paradoxically, the shift also triggered the growth of Arctic ice and ushered in the sequence of ice ages that affected Earth ever since, over the last several million years. The shift in ocean currents also led to the development of the MOC, the Meridional Overturning Circulation, or Global Conveyor Belt, that we discussed in episode 13. After the Isthmus of Panama was high and dry, uh, by about 3 million years ago, the terrestrial biosphere also underwent enormous changes. Land-based critters moved between the two continents and the Northern Amer North American species won rendering extinct many South American species in what is termed an invasion. A few South, Af South American species also managed to thrive in the north, um, things like the anteater and the porcupine, the possum and the armadillo. Plate tectonics also causes vertical changes in Earth's surface. Mountain building affects air circulation patterns. Probably the most famous example, and the one that affects the most people on Earth, is the link between the Himalayas, shown here, and the monsoon season. By the way, you see that gray band below the snow-capped mountains in the top picture? 
Yep, that's smog. The map shows the locations of the Himalayas, the world's home of the world's tallest mountains, and the Tibetan plateau that lies to the north of it. It also shows the location of Mangalore, a city in southern India. The graph at the left shows that Mangalore has a nearly constant warm year-round temperature and lots of rain during the summer monsoon season. By lots, I mean 40 inches in June and another 40 inches in July. Yikes. In case you're wondering, San Jose averages about 15 inches in the year. The monsoon season isn't familiar to most Westerners, but it's a fundamental part of life in Southern Asia. In the summer, moist winds blow northward off of the warm Indian Ocean. The Himalayas block these winds, forming the mother of all modern rain shadows. We talked about rain shadows in episode 11. The moisture is squeezed out of the air over southern Asia, producing lots and lots and lots of rain. Meanwhile, the Tibetan plateau north of the Himalayas stays bone dry. Geologists estimate that the monsoon pattern began about 8 million years before the present, maybe as long ago as 20 million years ago. Studies by other geologists indicate that it was during this time frame that the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau were uplifted, so cause and effect. The cause was the tectonic uplift of these regions. The effect was the establishment of the monsoon. Mountain building, controlling climate. Another way in which plate tectonics influences climate is through volcanic eruptions. Most of the world's active volcanoes lie above subduction zones, where magma is produced and rises towards the surface. Eruptions have immediate impacts on climate that may last a year or even a few years. Explosive eruptions emit lots of ash, and any eruption can emit aerosols such as sulfate particles. The effects of ash, sulfates, and other aerosols are to heat the stratosphere and to cool the troposphere, the troposphere, which is where humans hang out. This slide shows the effects of volcanic eruptions on climate over the last thousand years. Scientists have removed the effects of other factors that influence climate, such as orbital variations and greenhouse gas levels. The remainder is attributed to volcanic eruptions. And while this technique probably doesn't perfectly characterize the volcanic influence, other minor factors may not have been filtered out, it does seem to nicely catch volcanoes in the act. Large historical eruptions have produced remarkable, but temporary, cooling in the troposphere. Look at 1815. Tambora, in Indonesia, produced the largest eruption of the last 10,000 years. As winds carried ash and aerosols around the globe, solar radiation was reduced worldwide. 1816 was known globally as the year without a summer. And Europe and New England suffered widespread crop failures and hunger. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted, emitting large amounts of sulfate into the atmosphere. Average temperature around the world dropped one degree centigrade for two years. The graph shows many other downward spikes in the last thousand years, each associated with a major eruption. But that major event in the late 1200s is playing hard to get. Geologists can't figure out what volcano erupted. They think it was in a low latitude site, but they can't find a modern volcano that fits the bill. The site also must have been far from populated areas because no cultural records indicate an eruption at that time. But for now, it's an unsolved mystery. And that's the end of episode 14.